All right, this section is environmental issues. Now, this section is actually uh, in the middle of your agency uh, chapter. As we're going through class, most often I will set this aside to speak about it separately and also as a take-home study guide. So why does it show up in agency? You'll see here in just a moment. But one of the points that we will make is as an agent, what is your obligation in regards to disclosing environmental issues? Typically speaking, your disclosure issue is going to be you disclose what you know if it uh, or what you reasonably should know if it arises to a level of a material defect. So let's take a look and see what comes up uh, in environmental issues. Uh, interestingly enough, this actually starts on page 46 in your book, not 45 as the slide says. Okay, must be disclosed material fact to all transactional parties. So as I was saying there, if you know or reasonably should know that there's an environmental issue that affects a property, you're going to need to disclose that. Broker must disclose even if the seller believes it has been cured or removed. Um, you know, I don't, let, let's be specific about uh, this. Let me give you one example of uh, when this might be the case. If you have reason to believe that there was once a um, underground storage tank on the uh, property and you're concerned about whether it may have had issues, whether it was, uh, whether it was removed by a uh, company that is skilled in removing underground storage tanks. Um, if you believe it was done incorrectly, if you believe that the soils were corrupted and if, if this were done the right way, if an underground storage tank was done correctly, there should have been documentation from the company that did it and actually even recorded in the public record uh, that it was done. Um, there's actually a document that's created called a no further action document, meaning it's been taken care of. There's nothing else to do. If I don't see that as an agent, I'm concerned that it was not actually cured. And that's what they're talking about here is I would need to disclose something like that. Must disclose the contamination outside of property boundaries as it may impact the uh, value. Um, now, this is talking about there's a couple of notable cases going on in our area uh, right now. I know there's one going on in Chatham County, also one going on in uh, Cumberland County uh, as well. In each of these two situations, there has been some type of um, th there's a concern that the groundwater has been contaminated by some type of manufacturing process. OK, the water is tested and if it falls above a certain level or below a certain level may depend on whether it's considered a defect or not. However, keep your eyes and ears open for this. If you are aware, as a matter of fact, there was a, a very um, notable case uh, down there Camp Lejeune years ago where there had been on the base of Camp Lejeune, there had been a facility that did dry cleaning. And over the years, they had spilled chemicals. It had gotten into the groundwater. So even if it was not on your property, if it was affecting your property and it was nearby, that would need to be disclosed as well. Um, these could be major issues. If you think about what went on in Detroit over the last few years with the lead-based paint, uh, oh, I'm sorry, with the lead pipes and the water quality in those uh, areas, this can get to be huge, huge issues or it could just be issues that people need to know about so they can take into consideration whether they want to filter their water or something to that effect. Uh, whether it's on the property or adjacent to the property, if it affects the property, that's gonna be the key. Um, here's an interesting point. Please note that this is in red as well. If you are concerned about an environmental issue, here's who you're gonna call, a qualified environmental engineer or specialist. Now, you may look at that and you may say, well, that's kind of obvious, Chris. Of course, I'd call an environmental uh, engineer. Um, well, the tricky part about that is a lot of times on this exam, when we say, who are you going to call? The answer is an attorney or an accountant or a structural engineer, depending on what the case may be. So on this, watch out. If they ask you a question for this, they may try to trick you into thinking that you call it an environmental attorney or you call the EPA. Those are not horrible sources. However, an environmental engineer specialist, that actually is going to be the one that's going to determine where is a, whether there's a problem on a particular property. Brokers should be aware of the areas that they sell, however, should not rely on their own investigation. And again, I go back to the stories I told you just a moment ago. You have to see what's in the uh, news. You have to be aware of what's going on. And one of the things that's common when commercial properties are being purchased, for example, when the developer bought the land to develop it, 
they would have done phase one, phase two environmental inspections if necessary to make sure that there had been no history of contamination in the uh, past. So stay on top of what's going on. But having said that, there are times when investigations beyond that would be appropriate as well. Uh, in completing my thought from just a moment earlier, EPA or closing attorney, they may have some information, but the best source of testing is not going to be the EPA or a closing attorney. It's going to be that environmental engineer or specialist that we talked about. Okay. A couple of specific items that we're going to talk about. The first one has to do with lead-based paint. Now, there's a couple of dates. In Typically speaking, on this exam, we don't ask a lot of dates. However, there are a few that are going to be more, more important than others. There's actually two dates involved with lead-based paint, but there's one that's really, really important. Let's get the non-important one out of the way. Um, this law was actually passed. The uh, Lead-Based Paint Hazard Reduction Act was actually passed in 1992. That's not the important date, though. What it did is it applied to houses built before 1978. Okay, so if you're going to remember a date having to do with lead-based paint, remember, this refers to houses built before 1978. In other words, you were not allowed to use lead-based paint in residential properties after December 31st, 1977. So houses built before January 1st, 1978 would be subject to the lead-based paint. So notice the question down here on the bottom. It's not in red, but it's a great, great question. What are our duties with regards to lead-based paint? Now, when it talks about what are our duties, let's assume that it's talking about the agents in this case. Well, if I'm the listing agent and the house was built before 1978, I'm obligated to let the net seller know of his obligation to disclose whether he is aware of the presence of lead-based paint. If in fact I'm working with the buyer, it would be my obligation to make sure that the buyer is aware that they have a right to have this statement from the seller about whether the seller is aware of the presence of lead-based paint. Now, I need to slow down here for just a moment. That's the agent's duties. I don't know if you picked up on what I said but about the seller's duties. There is a disclosure. There's three things that a seller is required to do in regards to a lead-based paint. Let me jump ahead real quick a slide and see if it's on here or if it's, uh, no. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it and then we'll come back and we'll test ourselves on the next slide. So here's what I would like for you to write down. The seller is obligated to do three things in regards to lead-based paint. Now keep in mind, if his house was built after 78, it, it wouldn't matter. This is only if his house was built before 1978. So the first thing that the seller is required to do is provide a lead-based paint disclosure. Now I want you to listen closely to what the question is on the lead-based paint disclosure. The question is not, do you have lead-based paint in your house? It says, seller, are you aware of the presence of lead-based paint in your house? Now, I've got to be honest with you. Um, most sellers will have no idea whether their house uh, has lead-based paint. A lot of people say, well, my house was built in 1954, so it probably has lead-based paint. The question was not, does your house probably have lead-based paint? It's, are you aware? So if you're not aware, or if the seller's not aware, 95 out of 100 times, the seller is going to say, I just don't know one way or the other. In most cases, the only way the seller would know is if they had done a test, okay, a previous test. So the first thing the seller is required to do is provide the lead-based paint disclosure statement, okay? They're going to ask you for it. It's a federal form, but it's easy enough to print offline. They're going to ask their agent for it. The second thing that the seller is required to do is provide a pamphlet to the buyer and the name of that pamphlet is Protect Your Family from Lead in the Home. It was written by the EPA. It's a good pamphlet. And again, the seller's not going to know where to get it. So they're going to ask the agent. The agent, you could print it offline if you wanted to, or you could get nice glossy ones if you wanted uh, to do that. But the seller's going to need to provide that to the buyer, and they're not going to know where to get it. And then finally, the seller is going to be required to provide the buyer a 10-day risk assessment period. So if the house was built before 1978 and the buyer said, man, I've been reading bad stuff about lead, so I want to have the house tested, the seller says, fine, 10-day risk assessment uh, period, knock yourself out. If you decide not to test or if during that time you find out there's no lead-based paint, 
the risk assessment period was literally only for the purpose of testing for lead-based paint. There may be other dates associated with the contract, but the one associated with lead-based paint is a 10-day risk assessment period. They couldn't walk away during that period just because they changed their mind about the house. They could walk away if they found lead-based paint and they were not content with uh, that. All right, now I told you the three things the seller is required to do. Provide the disclosure, provide the pamphlet, provide a 10-day risk assessment period. Here's why that's important. Notice that I did not say that the, the seller was required to certify that the house was lead free. I didn't say that if the buyer found lead based paint that the seller was obligated to fix it. These are not required by law. This is a matter of disclosure here. If the buyer is interested, the seller will either tell them or the buyer can do their own research on that. Do you see where I'm going on that? That makes a fantastic test question because people assume, oh, the seller has to certify or the seller has to, if they find lead-based paint, the seller has to fix it. Neither of those things are the case, okay? The seller only has to do the three things I described. Now, let me remind you of this as well. When you say, why are we even concerned about lead-based paint? Well, we're not concerned about lead-based paint. We're concerned about the lead that's in lead-based paint. You see it in pipes occasionally uh, as well. And here's the answer you need to know for that. The concern with lead is it causes neurological damage, brain damage, and really the, the target group that we're concerned about are children under the age of six. Now, listen, I'm, I'm not saying that any of us want to be, uh, want to ingest a lot of lead, but having said that, most, uh, most adults obviously are not going to, uh, you see what the kid's doing in the picture here. We're not going to be putting our fingers on it and then putting our fingers in our mouth, or we're not going to be eating paint chips or anything like that. So it's really the concern with children under the age of six. They also have very, very small systems and their kidneys do not filter lead the way adults do. So that's why we're concerned about that. But the test question often centers around in regards to lead, what is the health concern and it's neurological damage, damage to the central nervous system. That's why we're concerned about lead. Let's throw a few questions at you just to make sure you understand where I'm going. What does the owner have to provide? Remember, the owner only has to provide the disclosure, the pamphlet, 10-day risk assessment period. Must the owner certify the home is lead-free? Absolutely not. If they know it's lead-free, it might be great from a marketing standpoint, but they're never obligated by law to do that. Must the owner pay for the inspection? No, no. During the risk assessment period, the buyer, should they choose to have an inspection done, they will pay for it. And I want you to think about this. Uh, wherever you live, think about the fact that there are probably historic areas near where you live. People buy those houses every day. This is not a big, big concern. I mean, it is, but at the same time, it's more of awareness and disclosure. And then the buyer can uh, determine how diligent they want to be in regards to this. Must the owner allow the tenant to inspect for lead or the buyer? This is actually a trick question. I haven't talked about this uh, yet, but it allows me to say two things. The Lead-Based Paint Hazard Reduction Act applies to not only purchases, but it also applies to tenancies as well. The difference is if it's a tenancy, I don't have to give my tenant the ability to do a uh, test. I could just say, take it or leave it and say, well, what's the deal with that? Well, lead typically builds up over time. And so tenancies tend to be very, very short in duration. And so tenants are, uh, by law, they don't have a right to inspect unless the, uh, unless the owner just gives them that. The buyer clearly does. If, the, if it's a purchase, the buyer would have that 10-day risk assessment period in which they could inspect if they chose to. So that's lead-based paint. Neurological damage, 1978. What a seller is required to do versus what he's not required to do. Remember, we're still in environmental concerns. Real quickly on uh, this, the reason that this one made our list is because in North Carolina, uh, the presence either now or at any point in the past of synthetic stucco is a material fact. Did you hear what I said on that? If it has synthetic stucco now, or if it has synthetic stucco at any point in the past, that would be a material fact. If you see EIFS on the exam, it's talking about synthetic stucco. It stands for exterior insulated finishing system or something like that. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a real quick story about synthetic stucco, but you actually already know the important part. The important part was the presence of synthetic stucco now or at any point in the past is a material fact. You say, well, what's special about synthetic stucco? 
it might not surprise you to know that actual stucco is a very, uh, it's a good product. You see it a lot of high-end houses, a lot of times on resort properties. Actual stucco is kind of a masonry product that's brushed onto the house. It's an expensive material, expensive process, and it's a good looking product in resort communities oftentimes. The problem is anytime that something looks good and we can bring it down to the masses, we create a synthetic version of it. Well, here's the problem with synthetic stucco. Synthetic stucco was actually a plastic uh, polymer. And so it looked like the brushed concrete. It looked like stucco. But having said that, because it was plastic and it was applied to a, a house, just like you would many types of sidings, the problem with it was, is if water got behind this product, it was not allowed to get out. So picture this, water seeps in at the cracks and crevices where two angles come together, windows come together or something like that. It gets behind the plastic and then it can't get out. And notice the pictures of the house here. Notice what it's doing. It's literally rotting the wooden framing in the house. And that was the problem with synthetic stucco. It was a class action lawsuit. The uh, people who created the product blamed the installers of the product. The installers of the product blamed the creators of the product. The real estate commission said, you know what? Our agents didn't really have a dog in this fight. We didn't put it on. We didn't make it or whatever. So here's what we're going to do to keep agents out of trouble is we're simply going to say, agents, if you know that a house has synthetic stucco, you must disclose it. It's easy to determine whether a house has synthetic stucco. If it looks like stucco and you go up and touch it and it feels like plastic, it's synthetic stucco. But how would you ever know that a house had synthetic stucco at some point in the past? Um, I would say just use things like old tax records or old listings. If it looks like it had synthetic stucco 15 years ago, and now you look at it and it has brick or cedar shake, that's the way you can determine. At some point in the future, these houses will be so old that people will not remember that at some point it had synthetic stucco. But for right now, if you have any reason to believe that it had synthetic stucco in the past, you should research that and determine whether that is the case. And if so, it's a mandatory disclosure. It's a material fact. Leaking polybutylene. I, I don't think we will get um, super, super tricky about this for exam purposes, but there was a class action lawsuit having to do with polybutylene plumbing pipes in the uh, past. And because of that, uh, the Real Estate Commission says well, we need to keep our eyes and ears here open on this. Here's something that, that's interesting. You can see the pictures there. The polybutylene is a lot of times referred to as the old gray pipe. It was installed in the uh, uh, early 80s up to about the uh, early to mid 90s. After that, it wasn't allowed in residential properties any longer. And the reason for that was, if you'll notice where the arrows are pointing, um, that's where a crimping took place. You can see that copper, uh, that copper band around that. They would put two pieces of the uh, pipe together and then they would crimp it. The problem was if it was not done correctly with the right tool, the right materials, or too much pressure was applied, uh, oftentimes it would crack. And when it cracks, it starts allowing obviously leaks at that time. So when I talk about polybutylene, I don't want you to get your blood pressure up too high, but I do want you to remember this. While, poly, while the presence of polybutylene, you're still gonna see some houses today that have polybutylene pipe. It, it wasn't that long ago that they were still able to install this back in the mid nineties. So you'll still see some, but the fact that a house has polybutylene is not in and of itself a material fact. It's a material fact if it has a history of leaking. So please pay attention to the words in red there. You must disclose if it's leaking or has leaked in the past. And you say, okay, obviously if it's leaking now, but why if it's leaked in the uh, past? Well, I mean, keep in mind with water damage, there could be ancillary damage as well. There could be mold. There could be something behind a wall that was just not discovered. Um, another little tweak to that is if you're in a townhouse community and there has been a history of leaks in one of the units, you should disclose that in all the units. The reason for that is in a townhouse complex, it was probably the same builder, the same subs who, who built it out. So they would have used the same process over and over and over again. So if you have a leak in one, it's very likely that you would also have a leak in another. In fairness to a buyer, they would want to be aware of that uh, history. Uh, also, the bullet point here says you have to be careful. You can't just look at the pipe coming out of the walls. Oftentimes, what will happen is polybutylene will be connected to copper. 
So when I look at it, where it's coming out of the wall, I say, well, that's fantastic. That's a copper by, uh, pipe. It doesn't get any better than that. Well, what I didn't notice is that underneath the house, that's where the polybutylene uh, was. So it can be deceptive. That's more of an FYI in the field than it is for test purposes. And I mentioned to you about the townhouses, so I'll skip that. Okay. Uh, and then in regards to a uh, meth lab, I don't know if you've ever thought about uh, this or not, but if someone has ever manufactured uh, meth in a house that you are showing, or if you're aware that someone has manufactured meth there, these records are typically kept at the sheriff's office in the county where the property uh, is. But the problem with meth is it creates toxic chemicals. And so if your buyer is buying a house that had been used for the manufacture of meth in the past, that is always a material fact. There are remediation procedures uh, for that. But having said that, if you are aware that meth has been cooked in a uh, particular house, make sure it's disclosed to the uh, buyer. Um, the walls themselves, literally the um, gypsum board, the drywall, uh, the carpet, uh, they could all still have residues of these toxic materials from the cooking of meth. A um, couple of things that uh, I added to the slides just because I wanted you to be familiar with these while we're talking about environmental uh, concerns. Another common one that comes up is uh, radon. Uh, radon is a uh, potential health concern associated with houses. And what I want you to focus on there is, first of all, I want you to understand the health concern associated with radon. If you're not familiar with it, radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer in the United States. Now, when you say it like that, it sounds scary. I mean, smoking is clearly obviously uh, first, but radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer in the United States. Um, interestingly enough, uh, while it is a big, big uh, deal, I don't get as uh, I, I don't get as concerned about radon as I do a lot of things because radon actually dissipates harmlessly in open air. So when I think about my house, if, if I'm concerned about radon at my house, well, not too much because we keep windows open a good part of the year. We let our house ventilate and things like that. So even if we were exposed to radon, it probably wouldn't be too much. And radon typically is a problem if you're exposed to it at high levels for a long period of time. Now, I've been here a long period of time, but like I say, because of ventilation, we probably have not been exposed at high levels. I don't worry about it. OK, that's me personally. Let's take me out of it now. OK, um, in regards to radon, though, here's uh, something that historically this has actually been one of the test questions. Radon is a colorless, odorless gas. Now, how, you say, how can they turn that into a uh, test question? Well, what's the problem with a colorless, odorless gas? It's not like you're going to walk into the house and automatically be hit with a certain smell. Not like mold. You know, if I walk into a house that's mold, I can smell the moisture and I can, I can smell the uh, mold and mildew. But with radon, it's not like that. Well, if, if that's the case, then, and by the way, watch out for a question that says something like uh, this. Radon is known for its highly pungent odor or its citrusy odor. None of those are true because it's a colorless, odorless gas. You're not going to see it. You're not going to smell it. Okay. So uh, how are you going to detect radon if, in fact, there's a concern whether there's radon in the uh, house? You have to have it tested. So what happens is they go in and they have these test kits for them. They have them from simple to sublime. And in regards to the simple ones, I, I don't prefer them. I actually like the ones that are a little more sophisticated. They can be done typically by your home inspector or someone your home inspector recommends. And oftentimes they can test it over a period of time. But these canisters, when they test for uh, radon, what they're looking for is to see if there's a level of greater than 4.0 picocuries per liter of air of radon in your home. The EPA has said under 4.0 picocuries of air is acceptable and above that is pro could be problematic if you're exposed for a long period of uh, time. So the only way you're gonna know is if you test. Um, by the way, I know we're talking about for test purposes here, but don't forget when you're in the field, when you're working with clients, buyers spend a lot of money on tests and oftentimes they're going to say something like my god do you really think i need a radon test it's not like we have uh, a lot of that the type of rock you normally see radon in uh well th the fact of the matter is you can't predict where radon is going to go so i'm always going to say yes buyer i highly recommend that you have a radon inspection uh done they usually run around 125 150 bucks or something like that so it's usually not going to break the buyer at that point but the problem with radon is, let me remind you, here's how you mitigate a radon problem. 
if it dissipates harmlessly in uh, open air, then what you need to do is you have to have need to have a series of vacuums and maybe some pipes that will just simply vent it to the outside where it dissipates harmlessly. Well, if in fact I'm a buyer and I find out that I have a radon reading above 4.0 pico curies per liter of air, often I can ask the seller, hey, will you fix that before I buy your house? And most of the time the seller will. And the reason is if they don't fix it for you, they're gonna to have to tell the next guy or their agent's gonna to have to tell the next guy that there's been a high reading of radon in that particular house. A radon mitigation, yeah, it'll run maybe three grand or so. So if I'm the buyer, I'd rather find that out before I took possession of the house on the chances I might be able to get the seller to take care of it. So let me look at my notes here just to make sure I talked about everything I wanted to. Colorless, odorless gas, second leading cause of lung cancer, that's a big deal. Dissipates harmlessly in open air and can be mitigated by just simply ventilating the uh, house. So yeah, I think we hit all the main points that we uh, wanted to. Uh, when you're studying these environmental concerns whenever possible, like, like it is in radon, what's the health concern? How do we fix it? Those are the main things that we're concerned about. Health concern, lung cancer. How do we fix it? We ventilate the house through these series of pipes and vents. And then finally, another environmental concern that you may run into in the field and on the test is asbestos. Interestingly enough, asbestos was not widely used in housing after 1978 as well, just like lead-based paint. However, you're never tested on the date associated with asbestos. That's usually a, um, uh, that's usually a, uh, um, uh, sorry, lead-based paint thing. Okay. So in regards to asbestos, what's the health concern associated with asbestos? Well, if you've seen the late night TV commercials, you may know this, that uh, the concern with asbestos is mesothelioma. I don't know if they'll use that word on the exam or not. So just simply think about it as lung cancer. Now, by the way, as a refresher real quickly, oftentimes on the exam, you'll get to go in so quickly that you start thinking that the answer to all these environmental concerns is lung cancer. Well, that's not true. Asbestos and radon, the concern is lung cancer. But you remember lead-based paint, that was neurological damage. That's our concern. So make sure you don't go too quickly that you accidentally stumble on that. The first bullet point, I'm just telling you that prior to 1978, it was used in a lot of places in the uh, house. Well, okay, why was it used in a lot of places? Asbestos was actually a really good product. Uh, it's very durable. And in fact, it has great insulation characteristics and it has amazing fireproof characteristics as well. So it's not a bad product. The reason the product is so durable, so tough, is because it's created through a type of striated rock and it has hook-shaped fibers in it. Those hook-shaped fibers tend to hold very, very strongly. Well, here's the problem. When asbestos is broken up, those, um, those microscopic hook-shaped particles become airborne. And once they become airborne, you could be exposed to them. You could actually breathe them in. And once they get in your lungs, because they're hook-shaped, they just attach to your uh, lungs, sometimes your stomach as well. But let's stick to uh, lung cancer as the main concern. So with asbestos, there's a word that shows up and that word is friable. You'll see it in the second bullet point there. I do have it spelled correctly. And in the third bullet point, I actually define what friable is. Friable means that it's crumbling, deteriorating, and worse yet, airborne asbestos. Now I can <gasps> breathe it in and it gets inside my lungs. The EPA says there is no acceptable level of exposure to uh, asbestos. You want to avoid it if at all uh, possible. You say, okay, I've got you appropriately scared now. So what's the, what's the deal? Well, here's the deal. First of all, if you know that you're buying a house that has asbestos, one of the words that you need to remember for test purposes is going to be encapsulation. Because with asbestos, if you know it's in the house, you can encapsulate it. So a very popular place for asbestos to be used was uh, insulation on pipes. Well, having said that, if you know you have that, if you encapsulate it, you wrap, wrap it with plastic so that it can't become airborne, it, well, it's no longer a problem. It actually serves a good purpose and you don't have to worry about it becoming uh, friable. So typically speaking, if there's a question about how would you remediate an asbestos problem? Well, there's a couple of ways. The simple way, is encapsulation, encapsulate it so it doesn't become airborne. Look, you could rip it all out, but if you start ripping it out, asbestos, then in fact, you're gonna have to have a someone that's professional in the handling 
of asbestos and they're going to have to treat it as a toxic waste and they're going to have to bag it up and they're going to come in with um, um, filters and stuff so that they're not exposed to the uh, asbestos. It can actually get kind of expensive uh, to do that. So you have a couple of different strategies there you would want to decide based on the, uh, the need and the expense as to whether it's, uh, whether it's worth doing or not. What do I want you to remember about asbestos? Health concern is going to be lung cancer. Uh, it's only a problem if it's friable. Here's my advice. If it's not friable, leave it alone. If it's in good shape, just leave it alone. Okay, not a bad product. And then, of course, uh, if it does become friable, the definition of friable, crumbling, deteriorating, worse, air, air, worse yet airborne asbestos. There's uh, several other things that come up in your uh, textbook on pages 48 and uh, 49. I don't find these to need as large a treatment as we did with the uh, previous ones that we talked about. For example, if there's a question about uh, mold, look, man, we're not solving the mold problem in this test. We're telling you if there's a mold problem, there's very likely a water problem as well. So the two things is, did you fix the water problem? Okay. And then secondly, is there a need for remediation of the mold? Are there tests? Uh, the house would need to be tested to find out if there are any toxic uh, molds that could be problematic for the homeowner. Uh, carbon monoxide, this will actually come up again in um, the chapter dealing with landlord tenant, because the important thing for you to remember about uh, carbon monoxide, it can in fact be toxic to you if you were to breathe it for a long period of time. And where does it come from? Well, it comes from the burning of uh, fossil fuels. And where in the house do we burn fossil fuels? Well, if you have an oil heater, and oftentimes one of the things you watch out for in the um, inspection reports, if a uh, oil or gas burning furnace has a cracked heat exchange, one of the concerns is it's leaking carbon monoxide back in the house. So that would be a red flag that you would wanna look out for. But in the landlord tenant chapter, one of the things we look at is if a house has a detached garage, if a rental unit has, has I'm sorry, an attached garage, that has an attached garage, and someone leaves the car idling in that attached garage, then the carbon monoxide could gather in the house and they could be exposed to it as well. Unfortunately, there's been sad stories about that in the uh, past. Urea formaldehyde actually became uh, in the news after uh, one of the uh, hurricanes down in Louisiana, I think it's Katrina, when a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the FEMA trailers were sent down for people to live in for on a temporary basis. Unfortunately, those trailers had manufactured products that had ure uh, urea formaldehyde in it. Problem with urea formaldehyde is if it gets hot and it's, you know, it's in an enclosed area, and think about what Louisiana is, it's a hot, humid area, and you're in these little FEMA trailers. Unfortunately, people were exposed to this urea formaldehyde. It's really more of an irritant than anything else. It can make you cough, it can burn your eyes, and things like uh, that. It has caused uh, cancer in laboratory rats, but it hasn't been associated with cancer in humans at this point. But that's that's normally where you'll see it is when these products that were uh, in the manufacturing process, like the fake wood products that they use in those FEMA trailers, when they get hot, they tend to uh, leach out into the atmosphere. And then there are a lot of environmental laws on uh, page 49 in your book. Look through all of those. I honestly can't even tell you what test questions I anticipate on those. I literally just want you to be aware of them. In the past, there was a question that came up on a uh, uh, practice test, and it was something to the effect of all these environmental laws, what's their purpose? And one of the answers was to make it easier for developers to develop. Well, that's clearly not the case. The purpose of these environmental laws is to protect sensitive areas, and in some cases, coastal areas. And so in that case, it actually... The intent was not to make it harder to develop. The intent was just you're going to have to get permits uh, to if you're going to develop in certain uh, areas. So take a look at the environmental laws. Be familiar with them. Know that they exist. And in this little subchapter that we talked about right here, which actually came up in the agency uh, chapter, what's our biggest concern? Agents are responsible for environmental concerns if they are aware or if they had should reasonably have known that they existed. And then there are some that based on dates, we're gonna to have to disclose. So for example, lead-based paint, if that house was built before 1978, we automatically have something we're obligated to disclose. If it has synthetic stucco, uh, we're, there's something we automatically have uh, to disclose. 
But anyway, that is the end of our environmental uh, section there. It's good for probably two points on the exam.